Well, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the New Construction Marketing Podcast. I'm your host, Anya Christianton, and I'm very excited to introduce our next guest for today. His name is Basam Salem, and he is a CEO of Atlas RTX. Welcome to the show, Basam. Good morning, Anya. Thank you for having me on. Thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate it. I know you're a super busy guy. Um, so you guys, um, I feel like with the Sam, our meeting was like totally like this serendipity moment when um, I've heard so much about you and your company from multiple people like Chris Hartley and, um, you know, it was always like, okay, so maybe we'll run into each other, but it's such a huge conference that you don't even think that, you know, you're going to end up seeing each other. So then we were standing in line next to each other unknowingly and then you know so but sam turned around and started chatting up and i'm like who's this chatty guy you know <laughs> and, and here you go so yeah, so yeah so always the lesson is you always turn and talk to the person next to you right absolutely it was uh, that was a wonderful day it was a pleasure meeting you there Thank you, thank you. Um, so we usually like to start things off by doing a quick intro. So um, with you, I, I do want to take a little bit of a different approach because I feel like one of the things that we've connected on was our background is a little bit similar because we both are um, immigrants and came to the U.S. about the same age. And so um, it's kind of an interesting story. And um, so I'd love to hear... Um, kind of like your journey coming to us and then um, you know obviously we'll get into your professional career as well how you how you got to be the CEO so <laughs> so I guess if you want to kick things off by telling us a little bit of a background on yourself fantastic and I, I do appreciate it we, we do it was funny to see how many parallels we had as immigrants so I came here in 1986 uh, as just before my 14th birthday with my parents who came as foreign students, foreign uh, on student visas essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the oldest of three kids and all five of us at one point or another went to the University of Utah on our, on our uh, student visas. Um, it's for that reason that I have four degrees from the same university, <laughs> you, you, would think, you would think. Wow, four there. degrees. All from the same university. Um, I jokingly say that when you're the son or daughter of an immigrant, uh, you only have a couple of options where they say, I'm so proud of you, right? And a doctor, a professor, a lawyer, right? There are those, uh, and they never quite tell, say it that way, but uh, you sort of feel it, you sense it. So uh, um, my sister became a doctor and I was supposed to be a professor of computer science. So I studied computer science at the University of Utah. Um, and uh, I eventually did a degree in business and MBA. Uh, I built a career based here in Utah, in Salt Lake City, uh, but traveling uh, throughout the country. I was fortunate to work for great companies like Philips Electronics and IBM Global Services and Siebel Systems, um, Omniture here in Utah, which was acquired by Adobe, InContact, which was acquired by Nice, and most recently a company called Merit CX. Uh, so I've had a uh, a, a series of fantastic opportunities I've been very fortunate to have, uh, mostly in enterprise software. So enterprise is a fancy way of saying business to business, software for businesses. Um, and now I am fortunate to run Atlas RTX, uh, which is a business to business software company based in Park City, Utah. So we're about 25 minutes from Salt Lake City, at about 7,000 feet. That's where the O2 Winter Olympics were. So it's a beautiful setting. Yeah, you're definitely lucky to be in such a such a beautiful uh, part of the country. It's beautiful almost all of the time, except when you show me the weather where you are sometimes, and it's like negative four degrees on a January on a January eighth or something. Like that. Um, but it's it's definitely beautiful here. Yes. So, if you don't mind telling us a little bit um, more about your company, so you know how did the idea come to you? what your company does be a uh, software um you know uh, and obviously how do you guys partner with the builders um, fantastic so we I've, I've spent a lot of my career even within the software companies dealing with customers mm -hmm. customer experience customer service customer operations um that really uh, that's my those are my roots so even though i was a programmer early in my career my roots as a programmer are still definite. I, I'm, 
I'm a nerd at heart. Uh, but most of my career really was operations. And then my last uh, gig before this, I was CEO of a company called Merit CX, where we did customer experience programs. We really we helped companies improve their customer experience. And I sort of, as I was figuring out um, what I wanted to do that would be my first venture, my first go at building my own company after having been part of, of some pretty large companies, I wanted to leverage what I knew. And I knew how to manage a customer relationship. And I knew the challenges that most businesses were dealing with in managing those relationships. And um, one of the patterns I saw is that businesses tend to be one generation behind the consumer. So consumers adopt a new channel, a new technology, a new means of engaging, and then businesses wait until that channel is pretty much dead with the consumer before they adopt it. Uh, you know? <laughs> and um, I feel that that's, if you think about email in uh, around 1990, just the very beginnings, um, the web around 2000, and let's say mobile web and mobile applications around 2010. Mm -hmm. I believe that's where we are now with what I call conversational interfaces and chatbots. I believe that, say, 2019, 2020, it's the beginning of that next chapter in how we engage. And when I say 1990, it was consumers who took on email in 1990, right? And then businesses later in the 90s. We were all consumers and were dealing with brands by 2000, but businesses didn't have websites or websites to speak of. Right. Right? And the same thing continues. And I really feel that today um, we are all messaging one another. That's how we all communicate with one another. Yet businesses don't do that. Businesses don't provide that, that sort of interface, that sort of channel. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to do is to, for once, actually create a platform that caught businesses up with what the hottest method of engaging, uh, engaging between, engagement between consumers. And that's where um, Atlas RTX stands up. So that's so interesting. It, it's so true. Even with social media, uh, you saw kind of like the companies jumping in a bandwagon, you know, very recently where social media has been around for a while and the way we communicate with each other. And yeah, absolutely. You're so right. Especially um, when we talk about the different industries, um, building industry is the one that tends to be so far behind, right? I feel like a lot of the builders are just starting to embrace social media where it's like, hello, you know, and I mean, uh, with some of the smaller builders, you still can come across a company that they either don't have a website or it's just, you know, it's a, it's a complete turnoff for the customers. So you're so right that chatbots, I think you're hearing more and more about chatbots and even with Facebook advertising, messenger advertising. So it's kind of a hot topic right now. So uh, you're so right that it's kind of, you're, you're bringing it together at the point where consumers are ready for it. And hopefully the industry is ready to embrace it as well. I mean, being at the International Builder Show, uh, one of the things that I felt in the air was so much excitement over technology. I don't know if you felt the same way, but it was, it seemed like it was a sh almost like a shift where um, all these builders were saying like, okay, we get it. We need to get on, um, you know, come, come to <laughs> the reality of the situation is that if you're not getting on board with this technology, then you're going to get left behind and you're going to get left behind very, very quickly. So um, that was definitely something I took away from IBS is that I think most builders are ready to embrace the technology. They're excited for technology and there's so much amazing technology available now um, to the building industry. It's just, okay, trying to figure out what, what is it um, that you can do. So if you don't mind telling us a little bit more about the messaging experience. So I know as a um, model sales rep myself, I have been just text messaging in the past, you know, and it's funny to even think about a couple of years ago where with some of the national builders, you don't have a, like a, a you know, a, an iPhone. 
they would give you like an old flip camera phone. <laughs> it's like, you know, so to text something, it's like you have to press three times on the same letter, that kind of stuff, to, you know, working for a custom builder um, or, you know, as a, as a realtor myself now, working with customers one-on-one. -on -one, I mean, I would say 90% of my customers prefer texting, right? So, and that's, that's all I do is back and forth, texting, texting, texting. Of course, it's important to make phone calls too, but if that's what customers are using, it would be almost silly for me to not respond via text message, right? If they're texting me and I would call them. So now you have a technology that is going to allow um, that method of communication, but you're also taking it to the next level because it's not necessarily the sales rep who's texting, right? It's the automation. So can you talk, talk to us more about like the logistics of it? How does it work? Absolutely. And I'd, I'd love to address both the really important points that you brought up. The, the first being um, this notion of technology as a differentiator. And, you know, I'd say 20 years ago, there were tech companies and everybody else. And then maybe 10 years ago, there were tech companies, companies that leveraged technology really effectively, but weren't tech companies, mm -hmm. and everybody else. Nowadays, everybody is a tech enabled business. And if you're not that, you're dying. It's, it's a, technology is how we get efficiency. It's how we provide great customer experiences. It's how we scale. Um, technology is it's, it's a, akin to the industrial revolution. We're in the technology revolution. And if, you, um, if you're not on board with that, uh, you, sort of, you can't compete with, uh, with others. So I completely agree. And we actually, one of our claims, and I'm not transition to your second point, one of our claims is that even we as humans, we no longer use technology just as a nice to have. We now too are technology enabled. We can't, we're technology dependent. Oh yeah, if you leave your cell phone at home, I mean, you lose your mind, right? It's like, what? Um, how, many, how many people would prefer to leave their wallet at home than leave their cell phone at home? You don't even need a wallet, right? You have Apple Pay. Well, which is actually horrible because I have mine combined. So if I lose this thing, my life is over. <laughs> shut down and reboot. Um, but um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I think you did. Thank you for the great introduction as to, to what's really motivating this. We want to message. We all have these phones with us 24 7. Mm -hmm. uh, but as, uh, as some of our friends say, it's almost as if we've forgotten that our phones make phone calls. We don't, we don't make phone calls. And maybe five years ago, we would say it was millennials, it's young people who message. But we Gen Xers and, and baby boomers, we still make phone calls. That is no longer the case. Um, an 82-year-old person likely, on average, prefers messaging than a phone call. Uh, what is unique about millennials is they're really, to them, making an outbound phone call is akin to writing a handwritten note or sending a smoke signal, right? You can do it with a little bit of training and help, but it's not natural. It's not what you've been doing your whole life. You, you, you engage people, and I'm sorry to throw a technical term here, but you engage people asynchronously. You're used to engaging people asynchronously your whole life, whether it's over SMS, asynchronously meaning I send the message and then they get it at some point, mm -hmm. not synchronized, a different time, and then they reply back. And even if you think about Snapchat and, uh, and social media in general, um, it's a very asynchronous medium. You put, you put yourself on that medium and then you step away and then that medium um, uh, you know, presents itself to someone else and then they respond back. So what we want to do is reach out to people um, on our mobile phone in the way we want to, where we feel control, we feel like we don't have to, we don't have to, uh, we don't have to stop what we're doing and be able to engage. And that's why messaging has become so so prevalent. So our platform is all around messaging as the main medium, and we do support uh, SMS, but we also support Facebook Messenger, and we also support messaging via the website, aka chat. So. Uh, we, we, we support all those channels, and we will add more over time as they become relevant. In North America, SMS is fantastic because we all receive it. I'd like to share with you some metrics to give you an idea of... That was my next question, so... <laughs> ...give you objective validation. 
would you believe that less than 5% of phone calls are answered nowadays? Less than 5%. I believe it. No one answers phone calls. Uh, I have a little joke. Uh, if you answer a phone call, you're probably a salesperson. That's about the only person who still answers a phone call. The rest of us send our calls to voicemail. And by the way, over the last few years, I, I hope you and your, your viewers uh, will relate to this, you now get frustrated at the end of the day when you have eight voicemails. Yes. Okay. Listen to eight voicemails. I hope Thank that goodness for the transcription service, right? Because we don't even listen to the voicemails. The voicemail, exactly. You reply to the transcription via SMS. Yes is how, so less than 5% of, uh, of, tech, of uh, phone calls are ever answered. Less than 18% of emails are ever open, wow. which is a really miraculous number. So you think about how many emails get sent, mm -hmm. and that number is dropping at about a third to a, uh, to a half every year. So that 18% will be in the low teens in 12 months, and it will be in the single digits in 24. Yet, all marketing programs in all industries it's not just home builders in all industries marketers do their thing with marketing automation on email that's their primary channel yes we have a few other things and we'll dabble in social and we'll talk about cool things we're doing but the vast majority of our focus is driving people to capture a lead and then we market like crazy over over email so now i guess when people are capturing those leads it may not be the email that you want, but the phone number, right? But people are a lot more guarded with their phone number. Um, you know, that is, that I, I'm not going to deny that, um, but I'll tell you that people are less guarded with their phone number than they were with their emails when email was the relevant medium. I think now the reason no one is as guarded is we don't even check it. And, and, and I, uh, you know, uh, again, a, uh, point to consider here is try sending emails to someone who's under 30 years old and see how long it takes them to see it. Uh, right. They, they just don't see it. Um, what's, what's unique about phone is if you, a phone number feels less invasive if the person isn't calling you. It feels less yeah. invasive if I'm able just to use it as a messaging. It's, it's sort of, um, it's what's expected now. So a 24 year old has no problem giving you phone number and a 28 year old has no problem it's nothing private it's just how we communicate it's my call sign yes especially i think speaking about the building industry specifically if somebody is coming either into your model and i think when when somebody is coming into your model and you're able to collect that phone number it's kind of expected that you would give the phone number to them if you you know made the trip um or on the website i wonder um so, so I guess and we can talk more about that because I'm sure there's a way where you can engage the people who are just on your website browsing through now SMS technology. So I guess we can talk about kind of best practices of how to capture that number without making it so like, ooh, somebody's gonna call me. Absolutely, you made two really important points there as well. The, the first is that um, there's essentially a, a self-qualification mechanism around engaging someone and getting their phone number. Um, so you're absolutely right to say, shouldn't we be focused on um, fewer prospects who are higher quality in terms of their higher qualification, they're interested, mm -hmm. as opposed to just getting names on sheets of paper with a bunch of random uh, crappy email addresses or crappy phone numbers that don't work. That isn't the metric. So can we engage people um, not in a, uh, a spray and pray sort of approach, but in a very one-to-one -one systematic personalized approach around their particular journey. And I, I think um, it's okay if someone's not interested enough to engage with you and not interested enough to give you their email or their phone number, that's fine. That's their prerogative. Let's move on and spend time on those who are interested. Um, your second point was around the multiple channels and how you do that. Our philosophy is if you come to the website, mm -hmm. engage us on the website. I want to be, if I'm on your website, I want to engage on your website. Now, when I leave the website, um, the only mechanism for you to reach me would be SMS at that point, because mm -hmm. it's the only outbound method at that point that is messaging, that's a messaging channel. So our, our approach is we don't just collect your contact info on the website and then start messaging you. 
that's why we believe that the web, web as a channel is still very relevant. In fact, a lot of traffic still comes into clients um, through mobile web. So mm -hmm. people are on their phones going to the website mm -hmm. to check out collateral, to check out information and so on. And if you do that, we'll engage you with our chat capability right on that website. We won't go to SMS. Now, if yeah. you happen to give us your number and you're gone, we want to follow up with you, it will now come back through SMS. So that's how we sort of interplay the duality of those two channels. That makes a lot of sense. And I tell you what, one thing drives me nuts is when I go to the website and I see the box, do you want to chat now? And I type something in and then it says, oh, our hours are da 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 You know, so that's where the chatbot can come in, right? Because you, we have the capability to not necessarily have a live human sitting there on the other end responding. Absolutely, and, and this is a great point in the discussion, Anya, to, to make, to sort of tackle uh, an elephant in the room that is often in the room when we talk about artificial intelligence in general, and specifically chatbots and automation, and to a different degree, robots and robotics. Um, if we as humans have demonstrated something over, uh, the, the, we'll call it centuries, if not millennia, it's our resilience. We automate the mundane. We, we, we leave to systems and automation things that are more efficient so we can do other things. We don't just sit around doing nothing all day. Uh, but I suspect that people from a few hundred years ago, seeing all of the automation and capabilities we have today, would wonder, what would people do? <laughs> so I'm not afraid of automation. I'm not afraid of robots. Um, I think we are going to master them, and they will, it will create better lives for us as humans, as consumers, and better experiences for us as customers, because um, it will delegate the transactional aspects of a relationship. If I just want a piece of information around price points in a community, um, do, I really, do I really need the human to be bothered? And do I really want to wait for the human to come and look it up? Or do I just want the transactional piece of information? Just give me the information. And you know what? I may actually prefer the robot because the human is, I don't know, they're probably going to try to sell me something, right? Where the robots... So, I don't know. I feel safer with the robot somehow. You're really, uh, you might be a millennial, Anya, because I will <laughs> tell you, young, younger people actually prefer that. Uh, younger people prefer the automation. And in fact, we have now found case after case after case where if the implication of the chat icon is that it's a robot, it's a chatbot, um, the click rate to chat is multiple times higher, and I'm sincere about that, mm -hmm. like two, three times higher, more likely to get clicked on, than if it says chat with Jack or chat with Jenny. Um, huh. he, he, he so, so the point is, when you're using chatbots, don't even try to pass them off as humans. You should actually make it apparent that it's a chatbot because uh, chances of somebody utilizing that goes up. Absolutely, and, and we also believe in authenticity. Um, not just because it sounds nice and it's great PR, uh, mm -hmm. but because that's how we all want to feel. I want to feel like I know when I'm dealing with a system which tells me this brand cares enough about me to automate things so I can get it quickly. Mm -hmm. And then I know when I'm dealing with a human because this brand cares enough about me to give me the human in the point in the relationship when that emotional connection is needed. And while AI has come a long way. It certainly is not yet to the point where it creates an emotional connection. And um, so we believe it's fantastic. Uh, we believe technology can actually make that human experience more human because now that human isn't wasting 80% of their day doing mundane activities like picking up the phone and dialing a bunch of numbers and leaving useless voicemails. They now can spend their day doing productive activities that I, as a customer, really appreciate. So it's, it's exactly counter to what people are afraid of. That's what I think is so ironic here. Everybody's af afraid of, oh, we're, we're, too, we're too focused on customer experience to give automation. We care about, we do everything via humans. And right. what I explain to them is that that's a much less effective customer experience because those humans are wasting their time. And when the people really need them, 
they're too busy. That's love not- that. Love that. And I think your point about just being um, authentic in the way that you're transparent, that, hey, this is a, this is a chat bot versus this is a person. It reminds me of um, a few years back when a lot of companies, um, specifically like tech technology companies would outsource their customer service and you would call to India and it would be like clearly somebody with a very, very heavy accent saying, hi, my name is Jenny or, you know, it's like, I know you're not Jenny. Just tell me what your real name is. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, so it, it kind of the same thing when, where you're making it apparent to a customer that this is a chat bot and um, they actually feel good about it. So that's true. Uh, I will say, you know, since we're both immigrants, I, I will make this comment that uh, I have had multiple cases in my career where I have had immigrants on my team here in the U.S. who have accents, and where a customer has mistakenly presumed that we outsource. <laughs> And no, she does happen to be from India, but she works here. And she right. <laughs> has a master's degree in computer science. She's very qualified. It's, um, so it's, uh, as an immigrant, I'm, 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 I'm quite sensitive to um, we should do whatever creates a great customer experience. And if we do that, we'll be fine. You know? and, and, and then I think we as consumers have to be sensitive to appreciating when a, a company is doing that. Uh, is investing in making making those experiences great. Absolutely, absolutely. So, a question for you. So, if um, is there such technology in our capability where um, you can capture phone numbers virtually somehow? Like, say, say you're having an event, um, and um, say um, say it's some kind of a festival, right? And you as a marketer would like to capture the phone numbers of the people who are in that area so then you can send them messages. Is there such capability or is that not a thing yet? Yeah, so I, I, certainly, I, I certainly don't want to leave your viewers with any mistaken information. My, to my knowledge, no. There, there is no way to, um, to overcome the privacy capabilities of a phone and just uh, strip the phone number and take it. Uh, what you can do, however, is just like every computer on a network has a unique identifier, not its phone number, but it has a unique identifier. Every phone has a unique identifier as well. Mm-hmm. Um, that identifier, we cannot connect, no one can connect to a phone number unless you're the phone company. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to think of is what you might be perceiving. So there, I, there are technologies that allow uh, you know, your Wi-Fi routers and your cell, uh, essentially fake cell receivers, I don't mean to get too technical, to kind of figure out uh, what those unique identifiers are. Mm-hmm. And now you can track that person. You don't know who they are. You have, they're anonymous to you, but you know that they are the person who was here five minutes ago, and now they're there five minutes ago, or five minutes later, and, and so on. So it's tracking at a very anonymous level. Uh, we don't do that uh, ourselves, but, uh, but I'm aware that that technology does exist there's certainly no maybe way. the future we'll maybe see. in the future although I think with all of us as consumers caring about our privacy and our our you know the security of our data I think we all struggle with with that so I certainly wouldn't want someone just to be able to get my phone number because they're they happen to be close to me or standing close to me mm-hmm. uh, but I also appreciate the improved customer experience that can be created by treating me as an anonymous identity. They don't know anything about me. They don't know my name, but they know that I'm here and that I might need help when I'm here and that I might need this when I'm there. So I think there's this intermediate step where I can still remain private, but get a better customer experience thanks to sharing some innocuous information. It's almost like maybe it'll be setting on the phone in the future. You know how like you can share your um, location so, um, or like, you know, how you can open the thing to say like, okay, I can receive an airdrop now. So it'd be like similar thing or say you're in a Verizon store or something and you just want somebody to follow up with you and you'd like almost open that channel of communication. Some, something like, I don't know. Well, that's great. That, that would work. That's a useful use case. Absolutely. Yeah. So interesting. And so let's, since we started talking metrics, let's talk um, the other metrics. So obviously it's very clear that people are reading their text messages a lot more than they're opening emails or answering phone calls. Um, And then there's also been studies 
that tell us how important is the actual uh, speed of follow-up, right? So it's like the, if you're the first company to follow up with that customer, chances are you're getting that sale. So with automation and the bots, I mean, that follow-up happens immediately, right? So the minute you leave the, you leave the sales office, you could set it to automatically send a text message. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and there's, a, so I'm not going to repeat what you just said because it's absolutely true. Um, and, and what's amazing to me, actually, if you think about it, is how few companies do follow up in the first place. So, you know, tier one or step one is just doing follow up. And if you go visit six home builders on a Saturday, I wouldn't be surprised if only two follow up within a few days. That's it's, it's that bad these days. But certainly between the two, the one who follows up more quickly is certainly relevant. And then there's a more relevant and more likely you're, you're much more likely to convert. What's more, what's more underappreciated is um, consumers are not aware of home building brands to the degree that home builders believe they are. Mm -hmm. I don't, if I visit six or seven or eight communities on a Saturday with my family or significant other, um, I just remember them as, you know, the one with the great kitchen and the outdoor patio, um, the one that was at this price point. And if you think about how we communicate, that's how you remember it's the one at, at X price or it's the one at, with that many bedrooms. Um, so one of the things that you can do with messaging that you can't do with a phone call is when the follow-up happens over messaging, you can reiterate the brand and you can reiterate imagery from the community so as you can remind the person, remind the prospective buyer what community you're even talking about. And as you get them engaged with that community, and engaged in the imagery and engaged with you, as a brand, via a chatbot, and a human at some point. Um, you're getting them more and more emotionally invested in, in, that, uh, in that experience and in that particular one of six communities. So it really compounds itself, and it really is amazing today, Anya, I, I'm, I'm sincerely baffled by this, how easy it is to step, to, to be the one that stands out of the six. It's the bar is so low that, executing something like this is a really easy way to immediately stand out from everyone else. Mm -hmm. And so can you give us an example of what kind of conversations the chatbot would be having with somebody? Like say, say I came in to visit this model home, now I'm heading out the door. So what kind of a message would I receive? Um, because you know, maybe if I am working for a smaller builder who is not quite ready to adopt the technology and we can get into the whole um, you know, um, kind of adoption of that and how they, how they could do it if they wanted to. Uh, but say if, I, if I'm working for a small builder and, um, you know, they don't have the, 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 or the capability to really adopt this technology right now, and I am a salesperson and I want to stand out from my competition using um, texting. Uh, so what have you found that people respond better to certain text messages um, you know, is there like, I'm sure you guys probably did a whole variation of, okay, let's try this, let's try that. You know, what kind of conversations take place? Absolutely. And, and there are really two sides to the coin. The first is um, salespeople love not having to do follow-up. Follow-up is one of those really difficult topics <laughs> in every home builder because um, everywhere you go, heads of sales are saying, my, my team's follow-up sucks. If they could just improve, if they could just follow up, we could sell more, get a much better customer experience. Mm -hmm. you talk to the core sales agents and their sense is follow up is overwhelming. I would spend all day trying to do follow up and getting no response. Mm -hmm. I would be wasting my time. So there is, there's this duality to, to the value proposition here where the salesperson can just be given the opportunity to put name and contact, so name and phone number, that's it. And then let the chatbot go figure out the follow-up and report back to me as a sales agent. What so the, it's that smart that it will take right. on, yeah, how sophisticated can these conversations be? It's, it's a, it can be as sophisticated as we'd like these days because we can build some really sophisticated chatbots, but frankly, there's not, there's not a need to be that sophisticated when it's a post-model home visit follow-up because 
the whole experience, you've already engaged the salesperson in the model home. Um, what you're now trying to do is figure out whether or not the salesperson should continue to engage with you or not because you're interested and you love the floor plan and you love the location and you'd like to learn more. You just want to know if you can afford it or not or whether the HOA is beyond your ability or not or whether the school district is the one you want or not. So, so the experience is really around uh, jumping, uh, the, the sales agent can trigger it, and there are a variety of ways that that can happen. We don't need to cover that at this moment. Then I, as a consumer, receive a message from the brand um, mm -hmm. thanking me for my visit and asking me for my feedback in terms of how interested I am and or what I liked or didn't like. And based on that, routing me to some call to action um, that can vary from... Um, as simple as um, uh, liking the brand on Facebook because I said I'm really interested and I love what you guys do, to I'm so interested that I'd like to schedule an appointment. Can I click on a link and just schedule a follow-up appointment? So um, the chatbot can handle that sort, of, that sort of thing all while reporting back to the sales agent who can then decide, you know, out of the 48 people who've come, this week to my model home. I now know the eight who are really interested, why they're interested, what questions they might have, and I'm going to engage them in real time. And that's the real time in our name, RTX, Atlas RTX stands for real time experience. So I want to engage them in real time and provide those answers. And if I do so, then I'm engaging the client, that's exactly what they want, you know this very well, that builds that rapport, that builds that intimacy between me and the brand via the sales agent, mm -hmm. enabled by the technology, and then I'm much more likely to close um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a home with that salesperson. I will tell you, we have seen a very meaningful reduction in what we call contact to contract period. So the, the, from first time contacting the model home or seeing the model home to when they're under contract, it can drop by as much as 50 or more percent because wow. we're not playing phone tag and we're not, we immediately know if you're interested or not. We already, we immediately answer your questions. Mm -hmm. It also drops the number of visits meaningfully. So instead of having to visit three or four times, maybe you can just visit once or twice. And we have now had multiple occasions, I bet you have experienced this, where the entire transaction was negotiated over SMS with the yes. salesperson the entire yeah. transaction, and they just show up to meet you to close the deal. That's yeah. just, just the sign papers. And, and that is so awesome, and that's what we all want as buyers. We want that comfortable experience. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly the use case. That, um, that's one of many use cases, but I think to your point, if you were to implement one, that would be a great one to do. Yeah, so make follow-up as easy as possible because it, it's so true. Very few salespeople do it. And um, when customers are being followed up with, uh, I think it definitely makes you stand out. And if they're being followed up with a chatbot, no, they may be also more transparent as far as giving you their opinion about your community and whether or not they're truly interested. Uh, again, you keep making all of the really important points, uh, Anya, because that's a really, really true uh, point as well. It is amazing the degree to which we're willing to tell the truth when we're arm's length and over a messaging platform. Um, yeah. we, will, we will say what we think, which means the salesperson and the heads of, heads of sales, heads of marketing can see the truth. They can get directly from the horse's mouth what mm -hmm. consumers feel and what they think about, about the product. Yes. And uh, Basam, so with Atlas RTX, are you guys um, builder only or do you work with other industries? Um, and, you know, what, what percentage of builders is engaging in this technology now? Really, really good question. Um, two thirds to three quarters of our revenue and our client base is home building today, production home builders. Uh, but we do have some really cool, uh, really cool uh, uh, other verticals. We have some uh, very large high-tech companies. We have um, uh, uh, tourism uh, organizations. Uh, Las Vegas happens to be a client. Uh, we have school districts. We have higher ed. We have Purdue uh, University. They're, they're wow. 
Um, so we have some really cool um, other verticals and we actually believe that the other vertical exposure and experience helps us um, um, helps us bring new and exciting concepts to uh, to home building but uh, but absolutely home building is our focus it's uh, uh, our partnerships as you might as you know uh, and our ecosystem is very very solid in, in home Mm-hmm. And say if I'm a builder listening to this and I think, wow, this, you know, this is a great technology, how difficult is it to implement it? Um, does it kind of jive with all my current systems or do I need to have a specific website created by you guys? Um, like how, you know, can you give us a little bit of a, a mechanics of that? Yes, absolutely. No, it's, it's very, very straightforward these days, but let me also be honest and say that modern software nowadays is pretty easy to integrate and implement. So uh, nothing, anything that comes to you and is, you know, an eight month implementation and a, you know, 14 months to go live, something's probably wrong these days. So we tend to go live in days to weeks. Wow. And it really just depends on, on how long the, 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 the long pole is how long it takes to train the sales team if it's a sales use case, or mm-hmm. the marketing team if it's an online sales counselor use case, or the service team if it's a, a back-end customer delight use case. Um, but from a, from a configuration and sophistication and involvement from their teams or their IT, it's very, very minimal. We, we've done it down to the science now. That's amazing. And um, you know, so if, if somebody wants to learn more about um, the services, the costs, the uh, potentially onboarding, what's the best way to reach out to you guys? Uh, it's just going to our website. Um, we, we, we also can give a text in number, but I'll keep it traditional and we'll <laughs> our website. It's atmosrtx.com. And you can actually go into our website and give it a try. You can have, to, uh, we have a few demo chat bots that you can experience and see what it would be like for your customers uh, to go through the process. Um, our pri- we, we've decided to be a very transparent, very, um, uh, very, uh, one thing I'm really proud of is I really believe our clients love us. And I, I, I'm proud to say that our clients love working with us. And it's because we're transparent and honest with people. So we have very straightforward contracting and pricing models that, um, that we don't play around with uh, from, you know, from three decades of a software guy who's used to uh, companies pricing here and then discounting to here and there's no co- correlation between what you're quoted and what you pay it's just so frustrating on both sides so we have a very very simple clean process that this is what it is and um, it's been really helpful for us to to keep that trust between us and our clients that's great and i'm sure you guys can learn all about it by chatting with the bots it's right <laughs> <laughs> no intimidation, no salesperson to be scared of. So. <laughs> yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. Very cool. Um, and uh, Basam, if somebody, um, you know, is, are, what are um, some of the upcoming conferences, um, events that you're doing, if somebody wanted to see you um, live or in person, connect with you at one of those events, um, I know you're attending, are you going to be attending the Home Builder Tech or no? Uh, yes, so we are. We're going to be there, and I'll be speaking there with a couple of colleagues. Uh, I will be speaking at uh, DCX uh, this year. We'll be there. Um, we'll be at SMA uh, in, in Florida. Uh, we're we're pretty much at all of the events, and I'm speaking at uh, at uh, most of them this year. And uh, I look forward to meeting everyone. I I really appreciated your comment about uh, people being the most meaningful aspect of these events and and I am sincere uh, just like you in in feeling like it feels like a reunion to us now and it's so much fun to see everybody so uh, we're really excited about that and uh, look forward to meeting meeting new faces and seeing everyone live. Absolutely oh and uh, I listened to your um, TED talk you know so I I, I didn't know if I should mention anything or not because I was like I don't know if you, you know, you wanted people to know or not. So uh, I, I, it's a topic I'm really passionate about. So I, I would love for you to let people know. I, I, uh, it's a really important topic to me. Yeah. So it's funny because when I listened to it, um, I like I felt very similar when I came and people would ask me about like Russians being like, you know, the like out to get us and like, and the cold, like even studying cold war in my classes, 
I was like, wow, I mean, I, I never really studied this in Russia. Like they, you know, like we always thought about us as like a great power that was like our competitor, but not like, you know, like, Ooh, we're out to get you. Like, so it was. After a while, you start going, wait, maybe I am a bad guy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm Russian. Or I'm doing- I know. I know. It's, it's funny, but, but yeah, my feel was the same thing. Like once, uh, like, of course, there's, like, cultural shock when you come, but then, like, you realize, like, wow, people are exactly the same. Absolutely. Everywhere so. around the world, absolutely. So you, you never know. You never know where nice people are, and they're everywhere, and bad people are everywhere, too, including right next door. So I yep. completely And I do look forward to seeing you at the next. We'll have to hang out more at the next, uh, at the next event. Definitely. But thank you so much. I appreciate it. I know you're, you're busy, so I will. Uh, Happy Friday to you. I will, thank you. You too. Thank you so much. Okay. I mean, uh, thank nice you. Talk to you. You work really hard. I respect you for that. I try. Hustle, hustle, hustle. Right? <laughs> the immigrant mentality. So. <laughs> See you. All right. Talk to you soon. Bye.